can I have, okay, I have the slides. Okay, good. Um, okay, so just a little bit about myself. I'm an information security specialist and senior threat researcher at Trend Micro uh, here in Canada. I do cloud and container security research, as he said, um, member of the CNCF tag security team, which it is like open community that everyone can join and learn about and participate. So if you want to learn more, just let me know. Um, I'm, I don't consider myself a Kubernetes security expert yet. I've been studying Kubernetes over the past year now, but there's still a lot of stuff to learn, right? And I have a personal blog there at katanasec.com with some uh, monthly articles that I try to post about application security, DevOps, DevSecOps, and Kubernetes security as well. Sounds good. So this is the agenda for us. I know it's a lot to cover in 30 minutes. I'll do my best to try to cover everything. If not, uh, we can always chat on the Slack channel there and I'll share the slides and everything later. Okay, so before we start, I dropped a few links on the Slack channel uh, already. So feel free to check them out. One of the main links that I posted is this uh, awesome Kubernetes security list. That's the one of the, the, the list that I created when I was researching and studying about Kubernetes and, and Kubernetes security, and there's so much stuff out there and everything is kind of scattered around. So it was hard for me to go back and find those links and find those uh, re great resources. So first I had like a, a small text file on my, on my computer and then I decided, okay, maybe if I do uh, publish that and share on a GitHub, uh, people will uh, contribute and will enjoy it uh, as well. So that's that. Um, so yeah, talking about the MITRE attack framework, right? So um, like, oops, sorry. Yeah, okay, got it. Okay, so talking about the MITRE attack framework, um, what, what, is, what is that, right? What is the MITRE attack framework? What does that mean? I, I'm pretty sure that most people are uh, aware of it already, right? It, it's, it's a global accessible knowledge base of, of opposing tactics and techniques based on real world scenarios, right? So, so that's that's the key here of the attack framework. It's based on real world scenarios. It's not POC. It's not just a threat model. It's things that attackers are doing on, on real world uh, organizations or, or even in honeypots or honey nests, whatever you call it, right? So it's, it's used as a basis for development of specific threat models and methodologies in many different scenarios. And it can be used uh, not just for defending your uh, organization and your systems, but also for uh, uh, attacking them as well, right? So uh, since last year, we didn't have um, MITRE matrix for containers, right? We had one for Windows, for Linux, and even for the cloud but we didn't have one for containers and also Kubernetes, I would say. But uh, um, Microsoft has published uh, kind of a Kubernetes that matrix in April last year, and they recently updated that as well, uh, which is not an official MITRE framework, but it, it's a really good source of information of, of tactics and techniques that uh, attackers are using it and they're seeing in the wild, especially uh, uh, data from their uh, own cloud environment, Azure, right? So. There's, uh, uh, there's a lot of information and, and that was used as a baseline for the MITRE attack for containers. So, so I'm gonna tell a little bit of how that uh, MITRE attack for container framework started and it was created uh, from, our, from my perspective. Uh, so, okay, here, yeah, good. So um, Jen Burns, which was the, the, the technical lead for, for the MITRE attack for cloud and also containers, uh, reached out to the community in December last year, asking for help and for data around the, this uh, uh, container vulnerabilities, container techniques and container attacks, right? From real world scenarios and, 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 and honeypots and whatever you, you had, right? So our team has been researching uh, um, Docker and recently since last year, Kubernetes with some honeypots, uh, some real world scenarios since uh, 2018 uh, on Docker specifically, right? So we have uh, uh, several honeypots out there that we monitor and we analyze what with the attackers were doing. So right away, we provided this data to MITRE. We reached out to Jen Burns and we provided them uh, with all the, the knowledge, all the articles and all the data that we had 
uh, related to this, uh, to those attacks, those techniques and scripts and all that stuff. So that was really interesting, was, was really nice. So we start working with MITRE since December and the first release of this uh, uh, framework was uh, published on February this year. And now the, this official matrix here, uh, the MITRE attack for containers. And I say uh, also Kubernetes because there was also some stuff that are very specifically to Kubernetes clusters. Um, so that was published April this year, 29th of April. Um, I don't know if everyone has uh, heard about it. So now we have that. So we can start designing and protecting your environment and, and maybe planning some uh, red teaming or purple teaming exercises on containerized and, and cluster environments based on that. So that's that's really nice. And what 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 what's, what's cool about it is that we we contributed with seven techniques for this uh, matrix. So kind of. 25% a quarter of the, the matrices. And uh, two of those techniques were brand new. They, they didn't exist on the MITRE enterprise or anywhere. So that's really nice. Um, so before that, that was uh, last year when I was doing my, started my own research on Kubernetes, I created my own threat model on a, a kind of a scenario, an attack into a cluster, right? So basically uh, one of the possibilities of get, getting access to a cluster, right? You have the, the Cube API server is one way, but you also have uh, vulnerable web applications, right? That's, that's what they're, they're running in a cluster. You're running maybe many different web applications and some of them are exposed to the internet, right? And if those applications have vulnerabilities, right? Your cluster can also be compromised, right? depending on, on, of course, the configurations or the, per, the permissions there are, are uh, a set in your cluster. And we're going to talk about that soon. So this threat model I did even before the MITRE attack for a container was even discussed. I did it last year. Basically, uh, uh, the scenario here that we're going to talk about, you have, um, you have a web application that's vulnerable to RCE vulnerability, right? A remote command execution and that get exploited and then the attacker get a shell inside uh, the pod, right? Inside the cluster. And, and from that, uh, uh, he or she can do any, any kind of reconnaissance to understand if he's in a, uh, in a containerized environment and, and how to do that. And then proceed to doing some lateral movement and escalating privileges to get secrets, to get access to API keys that you can do that from inside the pod as well, you can reach, reach, uh, reach the, the instance metadata from inside the pod and uh, even compromise uh, uh, the whole cloud environment, right? If you're running on a cloud environment, in this situation here, I did the model based on an EKS environment, right? So uh, we, we, of course, we, we model that and that, that's, that's very pretty and nice and colorful, right? But like we, we, we wanted to test it, right? So we deployed our honeypots in our, our real world clusters in the wild and we exposed the web application that was vulnerable to RCE and we waited. And it didn't take long for the attackers to find it and to compromise it, right? So the first honeypot that, that we deployed, it took less than 24 hours for the attackers to compromise the web application, get access to the cluster, break out of the container because they had privileged uh, access and compromise the whole cloud environment and start deploying uh, huge instances to mine cryptocurrencies, right? Luckily, we were monitoring that environment. So we shut that down right away and we didn't get a, a huge AWS bill, right? So I'm gonna describe what happened here. So yeah, basically you have a web application in this case here was a, a, a Drupal uh, outdated web application based on version 8.5.0 which is vulnerable to our RCE called Drupal Get on 2, if I'm not mistaken. And, and basically, okay, we designed something to make it kind of a, a, a website, a blog or something talking about cryptocurrencies, right? So here's the scenario, right? You have a, a, a public exploit, not just on Metasploit and, and on GitHub that can compromise this web application. It's not that old exploit, it's from 2018. So kind of three years old almost. Um, but there's also other ways to, 
to attack a cluster as well as we we saw in the matrix right you have the cube api server if it that's exposed and misconfigured and you used to have the dashboard which was installed by default on kubernetes and, and luckily that's not the case anymore but some clusters that are still out there they are, they are outdated and they have this dashboard exposed by default so be very careful with that uh, with the exploitation ex execution phase here, right? You can, if you can reach the API endpoint externally, and I think that's something that uh, pretty much everybody that's studying Kubernetes security, they talk about. Yeah, don't expose your API server, your Kube API server, right? Don't, don't expose that if you don't, if you don't know how, what you're doing, and if you don't have the proper permissions, right? Attackers will find that. And, and uh, as the example that I mentioned, it was less than 24 hours that they did, and, and we didn't publish the URL of our cluster anywhere, right? We just created a cluster, and by default on EKS, that uh, API server is publicly accessible, right? So anyone that hits that endpoint, they know that they get a, a response, and they know that there is a Kubernetes cluster uh, on that uh, IP and, and port, right? So from that, we executed the exploit that I mentioned on the previous slide, which is available on GitHub, right? and we got the shell inside a pod, right? So what, what can we do from there, right? Uh, besides, uh, before I talk about that, there's also an awesome tool from uh, Aqua Security that's an open source tool that hunts for Kubernetes security uh, weaknesses in, in Kubernetes clusters. You can just uh, download it and use it, and just uh, point it to your, your Kubernetes cluster, your API server, and we'll find a lot of issues and misconfigurations already. It's very helpful for assessing your own cluster or a cluster that you have permission to test. Okay, so yeah, going back to the attack there, what 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 can you do once you get a shell inside a pod? How do you know that you're inside a, a Kubernetes cluster and you're inside a container, right? How, what can you do there, right? So one of the things that you can check to is the, the environment variables, right? So there is an easy command here, just ch checking for the Kubernetes environment variables, and and probably every pod and every pod will have uh, should have those variables there because they need to reach the the API server, right? So you will right uh, right away you see that you're in a Kubernetes environment. Another thing is the service account token, right? If that's hard coded in the pod, which is usually by default, you can find right away the service account token that's used by the pod. To talk to the uh, to the API server, so that's that's two uh, uh, two indicator indicators that you're on a Kubernetes cluster. If you still don't know, if you don't, if you couldn't find that information, there is an awesome tool that's also available on GitHub that's called Mi Container. That's a container introspection tool, right? You can find out what container runtime is being used. As, as well as the features available. So if you download into the pod that you're, that you're in and execute it, it's gonna tell you, okay, th this is a clustered environment. It's a containerized environment. It's, you're running a Kubernetes or Docker. It's gonna tell you the capabilities and if the, the SecOp and API Armor are, are set and you have profiles there as well. So that's very, very nice too. Okay, so besides that, okay, you, you got a shell inside the pod, but you. You don't. You can't do much there. It's just a small container, right? You, if you want to mine cryptocurrencies, you need to either compromise the cluster or, or compromise the whole cloud environment, right? So in the situation here, uh, uh, a great um, tweet from Duffy Cooley, which is now working at Iso Valent, um, he he mentioned that from this command, which is pretty simple, you can uh, uh, you can do a, a cluster uh, a podscape by deploying another pod that's privileged, right? So you're doing a pod or container scape by de deploying a privileged pod. So what, what's exactly happened here? And I'll try to describe uh, uh, what, what's, what's, what's it doing. So on the left side, I have this, uh, his tweet. And on the right side, they basically have the, the command broken down into a, for, a JSON format so that we can talk about it. So let's unpack this a little bit, right? So the kubectl gets uh, uh, as a pod with a container, but the overrides our arguments make it special, right? So overloads the, the spec uh, uh, with a partial set of uh, values passed from the JSON, right? So first we see the, the host PID here uh, equals true. 
right? Which breaks down the most fundamental isolation of containers, right? Letting us see all the processes as if we were in the host, right? Next, there is the end center command to switch uh, uh, to a different mount namespace. Uh, which one? Which whichever the one uh, the one in it uh, is running in, right? So since that's guaranteed to be the host mount namespace, uh, the result is similar to doing a, a host path mount and uh, shooting into into it, right? Uh, the privileged security context is necessary to prevent uh, permissions or accessing the proc. Uh, slash one slash SNS in SMA, right? So uh, uh, be very careful about that. That still works. And that tweet is from 2019. Uh, some uh, managed services, managed Kubernetes service might complain about that, might, might break your cluster. So don't try in your production environment. Make sure that you have a testing environment uh, uh, that, that you can do that. Uh, and another note is that that doesn't work on OpenShift, which is an enterprise version of, of Kubernetes from Hat Hat, right? Because of pod security policies. And we're going to talk about PSPs uh, uh, later on the slides if, if we have enough time. So let me move on here. OK, so now we attack the cluster, right? We compromise the, the a pod uh, uh, from a web application vulnerability. We got access. We got a shell. And then we escaped the cluster through the, this, this privilege escalation here by container scaping, right? And get access to the node itself, right? And, and that's, that's, that's very fun, very cool. I know that it needs some uh, uh, prerequisites for the cluster to be misconfigured for you to do that. So those are, are not the, the, the scenario that you can see by default, at least on the latest Kubernetes versions. Uh, but, but be very aware that there are many clusters out there that are very, that are outdated and they could be vulnerable to those attacks. Uh, all, another thing to be um, very careful is exposing your ad CD. And I'm going to talk about that in a second too. OK, so how, how, how can I defend that? How, how can I protect my cluster from attacks? Isn't Kubernetes secure by default, right? Where do I start? OK. So the main thing here, as I said before, is worry about your Cube API server first. Make sure that's not exposed. And if it is, if you really need that exposed, you, you have a uh, tight permission, especially on your, your configuration of your Cube API server, but also your RBAC, which I'm going to talk uh, a little bit in a, uh, in, in a second here. So one of the great things that uh, helps protecting your cluster and understanding how, to, how the best practices of Kubernetes is the CIS Kubernetes benchmark, right? So you have uh, uh, this great document from, from CIS that's a, a prescriptive guidance for establishing a, a secure configuration posture for Kubernetes, right? You have over 120 security controls, security checks for your cluster. And it was created by Kubernetes and cloud native security professionals such, such as Rory McCoon, which is speaking here today as well, I think, and, and Liz Rice and many other contributors, right? So be, uh, uh, this document is very great. It has very, a lot of details and it might be scary at first because it's a, a, a very long PDF document, but it, it, the problem, the, the, the reason being is that it tells you why you should set that permission or the configuration like, like it should, why it should be like that. It tells you the exact command for you to check if it, that's properly set or not. And it even tells you how to fix if that's not properly set, right? So it's very detailed, very descriptive, right? But I know uh, um, there's, there's also specific ones for EKS and GKE. Uh, um, but I know that that might not be feasible for you to go each by uh, uh, control by control, verifying that manually, right? So what, what's interesting is that there is a tool for that, for automating that check. And that's also a tool open source and provided by Aqua, Aqua Security that checks the Kubernetes is deployed security. So it, it does all the checks right away for you once you point to, to your, your cluster. So here's just a, a simple output for a, a KubeBench results. As you can see, my cluster wasn't uh, properly configured and a lot of fails from those uh, checks, right? Okay. 
another thing that you need to worry about, right? And and we've been talking about supply chain attacks and and and, and uh, solar winds and uh, code cough, right? So you need to understand what your containers are running, right? Especially your base images, right? So you should scan them for uh, against vulnerabilities, right? Protect your pipeline against supply chain attacks. So those are some tools that are either uh, uh, either free or open source that you can use for, for scanning them. Try out, see what works for you. Um, and yeah, if you wanna learn more about that, uh, those tools and what my opinion about them, just, just let me know and we can talk more about it. But those are, are great tools to start. Um, another tool that you need to, uh, another uh, protection that you need to have on your cluster, right, is about the container runtime, right? So you, you, you scan your images, right? You deploy that in your cluster and, and they're running. And, and what happens next? How, how do I know if an attacker was able to compromise? For example, in the scenario that we mentioned, uh, uh, how do I know that the, the attacker was able to get a shell inside the, 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 the vulnerable uh, pod, right? Which, which was running the vulnerable web application, right? Uh, how, how do I know that? So that's why I need some runtime protection. And I think that the best tool out there that's open source is Falco, which is also a tool that uh, belongs, uh, uh, is part of the CNCF, right? The Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which Kubernetes belongs to as well. So what Falco does, Falco parses Linux kernel syscalls at runtime. So that's that's very very interesting. Using a technology that's been uh, being used a lot in container uh, security tools, which is called eBPF, right? Enhanced Berkeley Packet Filter. I highly recommend if you want to know about the low levels and, and runtime protection about uh, uh, containers and Kubernetes. I highly recommend that you check it out. Uh, it detects unexpected behavior on your cluster, right? So it, it has a, a root engine which you can easily create rules using YAML files to detect any kind of behavior. So for example, if there is a new CV published for Kubernetes or, or a tool that you're using on your cluster, you can uh, quickly write a rule for that and apply that on your cluster. It's also generate, it also generates alerts based on the threats detected, right? And it uses an easy and powerful rules engine. So it, it's easy to develop new tools and, and new rules and, and, and apply that to your cluster. So I, I highly recommend that you check it out. One thing that Falco does is, and it does well, right? Is protecting the runtime and making sure that any kind of uh, drift, right? You, you can have some drift detections, anything that changes on your container after it was deployed, right? It alerts you, right? So you, su you shouldn't have your, your like SSH running or, or something, a new package installed in your container after that's deployed to the cluster, right? You should generate a new container and de deploy that, right? Okay, I have uh, five minutes, I think, yeah. So I, on the pods itself, right? Just uh, you need to worry about your resources, right? Same thing applies for, for basic, basic for uh, containers uh, as well. You don't want your, your uh, containers fighting for resources, CPU and memory, so you can apply that. And it's also uh, avoiding uh, kind of a denial of service attack or self-denial of service attack if you don't do that, right? There's also a, a security context which you can apply to your your pods and your containers as well. So some of some of them are recommended here, which are the allow privilege escalation set to false, right? So you, you don't want your uh, your container being able to escalate privileges, right? The read read only root file system set to true, right? So you, you don't want uh, um, you don't want your root file system being writable, right? So that's that's why you have that. Uh, you should a uh, add that setting there to your security context, and run as non root set to true as well, right? You don't want your containers uh, uh, as much as we've seen out there. There are many situations where where that's needed, but you usually don't want your container running as root. Um, the pods here, I, I, I'm not going to talk about each uh, specific security setting, but those are Linux kernel security settings that you can apply to your containers and to your cluster as well. So you have SecComp, AppArmor, and SE Linux. Um, just take a look at those and see uh, what they do and what works better best for your cluster. Make sure that also that whatever is set on your Docker containers doesn't 
a Kubernetes doesn't inherit that. So, so you need to apply that again on your Kubernetes uh, YAML files. So be very careful with that. So we used to have uh, pod security policies and, and we still do, but they're being deprecated. And, and that, that's why I wanna take a minute to talk about that. So basically uh, a pod security policy was uh, a security context that you could apply on a cluster level, right? And so you have a lot of uh, security settings and definitions here that you were able to apply that to the cluster. Unfortunately, that PSP never went GA on Kubernetes and it was hard to, to manage and to configure. So they decided to deprecate that on the, the latest, uh, latest version, I think 120 or 121. Um, and now they're working on a new pod security, uh, it's pod security policy, which is called pod security for now. And what does that mean? What, what's, what's pod security policy, right? So we talked about the, the containers and we talk about the runtime, right? There, there's something in the middle there that, that's not checking the, 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 the images and the pods that you're deploying the cluster, right? And that's the admission, that's the function of the admission controllers, right? Admission controller does exactly what the name says. It controls the admission of pods inside your cluster. And PSP is one of those admission controllers, which you can use to check, okay, if you're deploying this pod into this cluster, has it been scanned for vulnerabilities, right? Does it have any critical or, or, or high vulnerability? Then you can block it from, from joining your cluster. If it's all good, if it's green, then yeah, it's, it has only a few low vulnerabilities, it's fine. Your policy allows that. So you allow that to join at that pod to join your cluster. So that's what pod security policy used to, it, it does right now, but it's being replaced for a new version, better version, easier to use. Uh, but you also have some alternatives there. You have OPA and you have Gatekeeper, right? You, we, we just saw a presentation about OPA and I'm not gonna talk about OPA that much. Uh, Ash did, did a great job talking about that. Uh, so go check it out. If you didn't see, you go check out the recording. But you also have Kyverno, which is another solution, another tool that you can use on your Kubernetes cluster to uh, create policies, policies as code to apply to your cluster and, and decide which should go into your cluster, which pod should go into a cluster and which shouldn't, right? And the, diff the difference between OPA and Kyverno is that Kyverno doesn't require a, 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 a separate language like called Rego uh, for OPA. It doesn't require that. It, you use the, the YAML files and YAML configuration to create those policies, right? Of course, there are some uh, uh, pros and cons uh, between those tools. And I, I recommend that you check them out both, uh, check them both out, right? So that you can compare and see what's best for your cluster. And this is the new pod security policy, uh, the PSP replacement link, which has been uh, accepted into Kubernetes. And I think they're working on the kind of the implementation now, but the design and the architecture, how that's gonna work, that's, that's already done. Um, already almost out of time. Let me see here. Uh, RBAC is something that's enabled by default on your clusters right now. And it, it's basically a role-based access control similar to any other uh, web applications, right? You have that, you have admin role, you have user role, you have manager role. So RBAC is something that uh, that you can enable that if you don't, it's not enabled on your cluster, if you're using previous versions, you should enable and apply that as well. So uh, uh, due to the time that I have here, I'm not gonna talk about everything, the, the new objects about our back here. So let's move on. Oh yeah, the etcd is something that's very important. The etcd is the heart of your cluster, right? It's the, the data, the, the, the key value store, the database of your, uh, if your Kubernetes cluster, right? It's a main storage location there. And all the cluster objects are saved there. And still, and still there are some, some, some uh, 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 scenarios that the etcd is being exposed to the internet. And you don't want that, right? Because the, uh, the etcd has an API. And if you expose that to the internet and, and attackers can, can get to it, they, they basically can become cluster admin, right? Because if they can change the SCD, the way that Kubernetes works with the, the, the desired state, if I change something on etcd, my Kubernetes cluster will see that change and will apply that change to the cluster, 
right? And, and so basically I can deploy a privileged pod. I can get all the secrets, basically everything. So be very aware. We did a, a research uh, a few months ago and we checked on Choda and there's over uh, 2,600 exposed that CD on just show them alone. And besides there are other tools that you can check too. Okay, I think I'm out of time. Uh, how, how am I doing, Frank? Hey, Magno, just, yeah, feel free to go ahead and take a couple more minutes. You know, I know okay. you have uh, just a few slides left. So yes. hey, you're doing a, a great job here. So yeah, just do a couple more minutes and then we'll wrap it up. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Uh, okay, so moving on, we also have network policies and I'm not sure if everyone is aware of that, but Kubernetes by default, all the pods can communicate with any other pods in the cluster, right? So it, it is a flat network, right? You can see that that's a nightmare for security people, right? So make sure that you create a proper network policy for your cluster. Uh, if you're using a managed environment, uh, sometimes the CNI or the, the, the container network interface might not uh, support network policy. So you either need to change that or use other or use other options, right? So for example, on the EKS, the AWS CNI for, for EKS doesn't support that. So you can you now can use instead of network policies, you can use the security groups to your pod. So that's that's pretty cool. Um, right. So one question, some some of the questions that you may ask, right? Does the front end pod really need to talk to the database pod, right? No, it should talk only to the back end, and then the back end talks to the database, right? So you're creating those network policies, network segmentation. That's very important, right? And what if an attacker can access the pods on the cube system namespace, right? I didn't say that, but the cube system namespace is the main location of the pods of the control plane, right? The main pods there. So that's that's very uh, uh, sensitive information and you don't want that. So there is a, a network policy editor that's created by Cilion. It makes it easy for you to create your own network policies. Um, and yeah, besides that, audit logs. Audit logs are not enabled by default. Right, and it's highly recommended that you enable them for security and troubleshooting. Right, you want that so you can. I know that Kubernetes logs can be very verbose, but you want those audit logs, especially for security. Right, and it's it's easy to set them up. Right, right, and in the easiest way, if you want to just save the logs on your control plane, which is not recommended by the way, but you just need a log path and a policy file. Right, you can set those up on the Cube API server uh, for configuration. So. I highly recommend that you set those logs and you can send that to, to a centralized location and monitor that with your seam, either an ALK stack or Splunk, whatever. But do check those logs because they have a lot of information uh, uh, that can, can tell you that some, somebody is messing with your cluster. Something is going on, right? So that's, that's highly recommended. Besides that, the basics, right? To, just to, to, to wrap up here. Uh, update your Kubernetes environment version early and often. Uh, we used to have four Kubernetes releases a year. I think now we're going to have three. The latest version is the 1.21, right? Don't use cluster admin for your daily work, right? So treat it like root, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you, if you don't use root daily, don't use the cluster admin role for your Kubernetes cluster, right? If you can, use managed Kubernetes service like AKS for Azure, EKS or DKE, right? Why? Why that? If you don't have any kind of compliance uh, uh, issues or, or you're know, like government entity, right? So with those managed services, you don't need to worry about the control plane because your your uh, cloud service provider takes care of that, and they have uh, uh, security def defaults for those uh, those scenarios, right? So that's that's easier for you. You don't need someone to to manage all that. And check out the Kubernetes benchmark document for more security best practices. I think that concludes my talk and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, I'll be available on Slack for uh, any questions.